Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. So good to have you here. And look at your screen. We are celebrating Hollywood legend, Broadway star, the one and only Robert Preston with author Deborah Warren, who's penned an extraordinary book that we're going to be celebrating. And here is that book right there, Robert Preston, Forever the Music Man. Really an extraordinary conversation we have coming up with Deborah. And as a matter of fact, I have my copy. And let me tell you, gang, it is a page Turner, whether you have always been a Robert Preston aficionado, expert, fan, loyal supporter, lover of his work, movies, and so much more, you know, his stage performance is extraordinaire. Look, this takes some time. Look how thick it is. It's really incredible. And uh, it's, a, it's like a definitive understanding and appreciation of this legend in so many different ways and it's highly acclaimed critics as well as fans alike are absolutely loving this book and deborah generously sent me a copy so i can uh, take a look at it matter of fact i was on a lot of television shoots recently we were in phoenix arizona and we were filming at the university of maryland and i was in pittsburgh and i was in san francisco and had the book with me on the flights the long flights you know east coast west coast and every time that i was on the planes i was digging in and there's a lot of great nuggets here a lot of things about this legend that you might not have been aware of and it's lovingly written as well this is this has been a labor of love for deborah and not only did she send this book and we're going to talk about the book we're going to talk about all the other cool things about this uh iconic legend robert preston she even sent me the bookmark too, which I used throughout the reading session. And it's really cool. Uh, it's available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the usual places. But first, of course, so many people know and love Robert Preston for so much of his work, but we're gonna tell you some really cool things about him as we remember him. Of course, the song 76 Trombones from The Music Man would forever link Robert Preston to the Broadway musical and the iconic 1962 film that would establish him as a Hollywood and Broadway star. His role as Harold Hill in The Music Man was a pivotal moment for the actor who appeared in dozens of films as well as theater and television productions. Although Harold Hill was admittedly not Preston's favorite character, it was this singular spectacular role that catapulted him to stage and screen stardom and ensured he would forever remain the music man. As a matter of fact, when I was mentioning that we were doing this wonderful remembrance and celebration of this iconic American entertainment figure, um, so many of you automatically, that's what you said. Oh, the music man, the one and only, the definitive music man. In a film and stage career that spanned five decades. That's right, you know, it's so easy sometimes to forget about all the years of incredible entertainment and so much more that uh, somebody as iconic as Robert Preston has shared with us over the many years. He managed to survive the studio system, which was very tough. If you've ever read books or seen documentaries on what the studio system was like in Hollywood at the time, it wasn't as easy as the glamorous pictures you watched uh, and still enjoy today made it seem. Also, he survived the fickleness of the film industry while maintaining his integrity and calling his own shots, which is another thing that is incredibly rare to do, you know, in this industry. And again, he's, he's truly one of the greats, uh, many years of incredible entertainment for all of our enjoyment. He uh, was a master also at shielding, which a lot of people did do at the times, uh, shielding his private life. And Preston was a distinguished actor and gifted artist on the public stage, yet he remained reclusive. That's right, in his private life. An extensive archival research and interviews with Preston's family members and fellow actors, including Rosemary Harris, Christopher Walken, Leslie Ann Warren, Loretta Swit, who was a guest on the Jim Masters show as well. If you didn't see that episode, you can see it in our archives here on uh, our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. Uh, they really express some amazing things about Robert uh, through the book. Barbara Gunton, uh, Bob Gunton, that is, and Never Small and many others have 
unveiled a richly detailed portrait of the gifted actor's personal life, as well as an overview of the films and Broadway productions to which he lent his extraordinary talent over the many years as well. So this is a really special episode as again, we remember this iconic American figure of film, of stage. There he is, of course, with the one and only Lucio Ball and uh, his wife, Catherine. So many incredible, incredible things we've dug up here for your pleasure. Gary Cooper, Ray Milland, and Robert Preston. Uh, this is really something very special. So uh, if you are somebody who is a, a, a lover of classic Hollywood, uh, you're a lover of Robert Preston, you love the movies, or you just love entertainment, of course, the music man there. We're going to go over a lot of the other things he's been involved in. You're going to love this conversation we have with uh, Deborah joining us here. Again, she's coming to us from just north of Chicago. That's where she makes her home in uh, the beautiful uh, suburbs of uh, northern Chicago, between uh, Chicago and beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And she's delighted to be here, and we are delighted to have her here as well. Now, you're going to see her piano uh, you know, to the left of her. She doesn't feel like playing the piano tonight because we're celebrating Robert uh, Preston. Maybe the next time we have her on, we'll get her to tickle those ivories. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Deborah. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, today. it's a pleasure to be here with you, Jim. So delighted. I'm really fascinated uh, by your extraordinary background. Before we, and I'll have you, you know, I wanted to talk about Robert, of course, a little bit in the introduction there, but I wanted you to tell and let folks know about your extraordinary background because you are the co-author of, the author or co-author of four books. This here, Robert Preston, Forever the Music Man, uh, Highwood, Illinois, 100 Years of Progress, and several others, we'll talk about them all. And you also have this wonderful background, you know, in healthcare and wellness and so much more. Tell us about that background first, in addition to being an author. My clinic, well, my background, my clinical training is in clinical social work. And I've been doing that for about 40 years, so long time. Uh, and I've always been fascinated by human nature, what makes people tick, um, and everything involved with that. So uh, that being said, um, that was kind of a, a segue into my uh, delving into the history and past of Robert Preston there. So um, it was, like I said, it was uh, in private practice for many years, um, worked in uh, various agencies. And then uh, along the way, um, I was always interested in writing and research and history. So I was uh, tapped on a couple occasions to do research into um, various entities and write these books on uh, you know, whether it was a town, a parish, um, whatever. And then maybe oh, 20 some years ago, I also authored a screenplay, which was kind of futuristic. Um, it involved uh, AI and computers, and mm. that was kind of the uh, drift of it all. And, and all, it was it's almost prescient to what you are seeing today with all this all the computers and the AI kind of thing. Nice. Uh, it didn't, it, I, I did have an agent and we did try to, you know, peddle it and sell it. But as with a lot of um, projects like that, it just didn't, you know, it just didn't go anywhere. But, you know, I, I was able to put that together and I was really proud of that. So uh, my, my background, as I mentioned before, in human behavior really, I think, helped with digging into um, what Robert Preston was all about and uh, helped me, you know, tackle, tackle his biography. You know, it's really amazing too. just some of the, the commentary that's come in for the book has been extraordinary. Author Deborah Warren conducted extensive research to bring Preston's life to light, resulting in a biographical sketch that offers not only, you know, enlightenment, but also this enlightenment about his 
personality and career and a sense of the times that influenced his vocational trajectory. The, the commentary that has come in has been really extraordinary. For you, what spurred on early on in your life, Deborah, the fascination and appreciation of Robert Preston, the entertainer, and Robert Preston, as you, you know, did your research, you learned so much about this beloved iconic figure, Robert Preston, the man. What spurred on the interest for you early on? Were you just a, a super fan? Did you always just appreciate his expertise? What was it for you early on? Uh, of course, as most people of my generation, I saw the music man as, you know, a, somebody young and loved it, loved him. Uh, and I'd seen a lot of the other movies that he was in through the years and appreciated his talent. So that being said, um, I was I was always a fan of his work. Um, when the pandemic hit and everybody was on lockdown and uh, kind of trying to find their way through this new experience, I did go online and was trying to do a little bit of research on him because one of the things that I noted um, on some of these websites that kind of were fan pages was that there wasn't a whole lot of information about uh, his backstory and his life. And so I sort of took that as a challenge. And again, this was during the pandemic when a lot of us had a lot of downtime. And um, I began digging and it's, um, it's kind of um, parallel to things that I would do when I was doing uh, investigations for the court in my mm. clinical practice. So yeah. I began digging and um, and as I did so, I began compiling information. And in order to fact check, I said, well, you know, let me try to reach out to some of these um, actors and actresses who were uh, co-workers of him to try to find out more. And I reached out to his family members as well. And uh, I just began compiling information and it kept going. And it took about two years to get um, all of the information uh, that I needed. And I really tried um, not to make it a gossipy book. Right. I didn't uh, put in my own, I don't say clinical uh, comments. I didn't put in, um, you know, what I thought was going on. I just wanted the facts and I wanted readers to kind of draw their own conclusions about what was happening in his life and perhaps why. What are some of the things that stood out for you? I mean, in, in reading the book, and again, thank you for sending the book. It really is a, an extraordinary. It gave me such a, a deeper, you know, working in this industry of, of television, radio, and stage and film myself, it gave me a much richer, more fuller appreciation, again, of not just the the iconic entertainer, you know, the person that we see on stage, the person that is in these phenomenal movies and things of that nature, but also appreciation of what made him tick and his desire to want to be private about his life and to, you know, have be out there and did what he had to do on stage and loved what he did, but also maintain his his private existence, which isn't always in Hollywood or anywhere in life, especially these days. To, to pull off. What are some things that you discovered as somebody who appreciated him before for his work, The Music Man and all the other material, but through your research surprised you? I was particularly surprised that he began acting at a young age. He was about eight. Um, he started in vaudeville, you know, at minor parts. And I think the most amazing thing was that um, he was a Shakespearean trained actor uh, through the Pasadena Playhouse. Um, he had extensive uh, training in, with all these Shakespearean plays and really honed his craft there and became um, outstanding as an actor. In fact, he was kind of the darling of the Pasadena Playhouse and was placed in many, many of the plays they had there. Um, the other thing that I was... Um, kind of interested to learn was that he had a photographic memory. And mm. one of the um, incidents that, you know, kind of um, the oldest for me uh, was when he was at the playhouse and through 
various things that happened. Um, one of the actors in a major play um, had to, they had to pull him out uh, the night before the production, and he quickly had to learn the dialogue of the entire Shakespearean play mm. in one evening. And uh, his then girlfriend, uh, later wife, uh, Catherine Craig, uh, went over the lines with him. And the next day when he was uh, in the performance, it was completely flawless. No one in the audience, none of his co-stars even knew that um, he had just had less than 24 hours to rehearse um, all the lines for this play. Um, and the, the reviews for it were phenomenal as well from the critics who saw it. So those kinds of small little things, um, you know, he was such a big personality and um, had a lar larger than life career, but it was those small things that helped me understand him a little bit more um, as a human being. Why do you think uh, people have such a curiosity about him, about his life, about his work, even today, after all the years that he was with us, and of course we we lost him, um, and I believe it was around age sixty-eight, right? Yes, and he had passed. 68. So it was uh, it was early on, and still he had so much more to to give. And matter of fact, there we have um, passed in uh, Saint. Uh, Santa Barbara, California, at the age of 68, so much more to give. Um, why do you think we still have this fascination about him and why so many people are, are, of course, loving this book as it does fill in some of those gaps? But from your perspective and from what you've been hearing, what is it about Robert Preston that really resonates with people? Well, I think one of the things is the fascination that people have with the music man itself, with the um, with the play, with the uh, movie. And there's been so many people who've said to me, uh, whether it's been online conversations or in person, that a lot of the times when they're down or they're feeling low, um, they'll watch the music man. They'll watch it, you know, if they have a DVD online, et cetera. They find it very uplifting, very reassuring. Um, and of course, he was the primary role in that movie. Um, he was, you know, very charismatic in the role as well as charismatic in life. So I think that's part of it. Um, the other thing is I think many people, maybe not so much the younger generation, but I would say those that are 40 and up, um, that remember some of the um, vehicles that he was in, whether it was TV, Broadway, uh, the movies, uh, they remember him as a great actor. And so I think, uh, and, and I think that personal charisma came across on screen. And so uh, of the people that I've spoken to again, uh, a lot of them have talked about that great charisma, how they loved everything he was in, uh, how he, you know, le left this earth too soon, etc. And so I think for all of those reasons, there's still uh, a fascination with Mr. Preston. You know, for some, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, they'd probably be surprised that that, you know, Harold Hill, that wasn't necessarily his personal favorite role, yeah. but it really was a defining role for him yes. in his in his career, right? It was. Um, he left Hollywood a little bitter only because um, he had been in some conflict with Cecil B. DeMille, who um, used him in several uh, of his movies. And Preston felt that he was just being regurgitated in different roles, in different, different costumes, but um, he wasn't able to break out of that mold. And um, he kind of had a run in with DeMille. And the feeling is, I think he believed and possibly true that um, DeMille put a, a kibosh on his Hollywood career going further, just as he did um, Hedy Lamar and uh, other people. If you didn't play the game, your career was kind of over. Um, and he, he kind of felt a thrill once he was on Broadway uh, playing Harold Hill in The Music Man, 1957, and got his uh, first Tony Award. Uh, the one thing that stuck out for him was he was so happy that DeMille 
was still alive and could see his success. So um, for him, uh, the music man was not only a validation of his uh, skills and his, you know, acting chops, but also it was kind of a way to say to DeMille, you may have tried to keep me down, but um, here I am and I'm, you know, I'm being recognized for my talent. Which is really uh, extraordinary. How were you, from what you've learned, and again, the book really, I don't want to give too much away with the book because we want people to read it. And, and it's a book, as I found, and I was on all the flights crisscrossing the country <laughs> for the television projects, didn't really want to put it down. And I couldn't wait, believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds, to get back on another flight so <laughs> I could sit and just dig in deep. Um, the The material itself, as far as gathering the material, you brought in some really terrific people. I mentioned Loretta Swit and others. Uh, what was that process like behind the scenes? How long did it take? And, and what was the research and the extensive digging like and bringing in some of these others who shared their fond memories as well? Um, well, as I mentioned before, the research took about two years of two years time um, to get everything in, fact check everything. Um, and surprisingly, the majority of people that I reached out to, whether it was family or the co-stars in his major films, of course, who are still around, there's a lot um, who've passed away. Um, but of those that were are still with us, uh, I would say the majority kind of leapt at the chance to be able to talk about their co-star and good friend. And um, the first person I actually spoke to was Rosemary Harris. Um, I had reached out to her daughter some months before and said, you know, I'd like to be able to, told her what I was doing, said I'd like to be able to interview uh, Rosemary for uh, the, this biography of Preston. And I was flabbergasted when my phone rang one day and there was Rosemary on the other end. Um, ready and willing to share her insights and her, her history and, um, you know, about her beloved friend. So that was kind of the first um, interview I had. And she made suggestions as to who maybe could offer additional information. And so um, things went from there. So I am really indebted to Rosemary Harris, whose birthday is today, by the way. She's 96 today. Happy um, birthday. She's, yeah, and she's still walking the picket lines, I understand, for SAG after. She's still active, so God bless her. Um, so it was Rosemary that um, kind of gave me the initial seeds of information, and I went from there. You know, um, they say, of course, from Broadway to Hollywood and back again, his tireless work ethic and solid professionalism have always been legendary, but now no single narrative has so thoroughly portrayed the man behind the performer. And you've written this fascinating and meticulous chronological understanding of his life uh, in such a phenomenal way, gregarious on one level, but yet intensely private. How was he able to manage both because again you know in hollywood that's not easy to to pull off uh a lot of the uh credit for that actually goes to his wife um he managed to stay extremely professional whether it be on a hollywood movie set or on a broadway stage you know uh i'm sure you know you've dealt with a lot of um celebrities in your interviews and through the years and I'm sure you've heard various frustrations with different directors or different co-stars or, you know, it's just part of the game. I mean, it's part of part and parcel of being an actor, whether it's in Hollywood or Broadway. And I've even heard some complaint about craft services. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, he, he obviously, you know, had frustrations, but it was very important to him to be the consummate professional, whether he was on a movie set or a Broadway stage or TV or, you know, radio, wherever he, wherever he was performing. And the issues that he may have had, um, I'm thinking about Margaret Sullivan, for instance, that was one of the people that he dealt with on Broadway that 
you know, he had issues with, never really said anything. But of course, he'd go home and, you know, vent to his wife. And so Catherine was that sounding board. Uh, I think that kind of drew the two of them close together as well. Um, she was his rock and he would vent to her. And so he could go back for the next day's shooting or the next day's rehearsal or the next stage performance. And uh, she understood she was an actress herself. And um, I think that made it easier for him to kind of leave all of that stuff behind. He could go to work the next day kind of with a clean slate and deal with whatever he had to, whatever he was dealing with. But it was important for him. Uh, you know, he took his, the acting very seriously and didn't want to have any conflicts on the set or on the stage and create any problem. He just wanted to uh, perform as best as he could. So I think it was the great relationship he had with his wife despite all the philandering, he did have a great relationship with his wife. And uh, I think that really helped him be the consummate professional that he was. And revered in that way and always mm -hmm. recognized in that way. Uh, would you say that he felt, whether it is Hollywood or Broadway or both, appreciated? Do you think he felt that they gave him his due, that he was um, respected and, and understood? at the level that he would hope or one would hope putting all those years in, I mean, countless movies, countless performances, 50 plus years of solid work. You think he felt appreciated and respected and, and heard by the industry? I think it wasn't until the end of his life, toward the end of his life, that he um, felt that way. Um, there was one uh, incident that happened um, Kath, he and Catherine were going to a Broadway play. Uh, this was after Victor Victoria. Right. And um, he they showed up and there was a crowd of people outside who were clapping and just, you know, carrying on. And um, as he was coming into the theater and he was as he was coming down the road to a seat and he made a comment to um, Morton DaCosta, who uh, directed him not only in The Music Man, but Island of Love, uh, that this was the first time that this had happened to him and that he had had this public recognition and he was just overwhelmed. Um, and then in the ensuing years following Victor Victoria, he received a series of uh, either Lifetime Achievement Awards or various uh, tributes and awards for his uh, acting and for his lifetime of service in the uh, Hollywood and Broadway uh, family. And so it was toward the end of his life that he finally was able to understand or realize that um, people, you know, appreciated his talent. So it wasn't until the, the later part, yes. which, you know, oftentimes that is what uh, tends to happen. And, um, you know, it, it, when you look back at some of the extraordinary, you dug up a bunch of different photos and different things over the years, the different roles and the different looks and the different projects, usually a lot of times in television, film, whatever it may be, stage, you tend to get pegged in, in one particular role, one look, one style. But he's able to pull off, I mean, here he is with Lucio Ball and Mame, so many different roles and so many different characters and take it on with... Uh, zest and vim and vigor which i think is kind of extraordinary when you look when you go back through and in the book you mention you know there's a nice listing of his work um all of the material that he was in with all these different roles that he i mean he was a consummate performer and actor um that's not always easy to pull off usually you get typecast or you get you know, you're in a Western or you're, you're the suburban neighbor or whatever it is. He well, he did. He, he was uh, initially, initially uh, yeah. typecast. Um, and uh, I think it's because they didn't quite know what to do with him. Yeah. And uh, I think in his screen tests or just in his offstage um, persona, uh, as, as Barbara Cook uh, has said, uh, she described him as walking sex. She felt that there was such a sex appeal about him on a personal level, such magnetism, and perhaps the you know studio brass saw that too. They weren't quite sure. I don't think 
uh, where where to put him, uh, what kind of movies to put him in. He so desperately wanted to be a lady man. And I think for a variety of reasons, um, the studio steered away from that. So he was in a lot of Westerns um, and uh, the B-type the B movies uh, for many years. He did have a, a few A movies, you know, Union Pacific and Bo Jest and things of that nature. But uh, those were all not romantic per se. They were more action uh, oriented. And so I think the studio felt him safe in those kind of vehicles. Um, but it wasn't until uh, he started on Broadway and he was on, he was in a variety of kind of romantic, rom-com, romantic comedies um, that he was really able to flex his acting chops. Uh, he knew, the thing is in his gut, he knew he could do anything. He knew it was, he was capable of everything. Uh, although he had this photogenic memory, he was also great, um, at ad living and um, as, as uh, Blake Edwards asked him to do in Victor Victoria, a lot of that was off the cuff. Um, and so he was great at being able to do that too. So not only sticking to the lines verbatim, but he was also phenomenal at ad living in, in scenes. And he knew, uh, and not, not in a, not in a egotistic way, but he knew what his capabilities were and, in years pre prior was extremely frustrated that the studios weren't allowing him to flex his acting muscles, so to speak in, in other types of roles. They had him, uh, yeah. In, in their thought process, just in one particular sort of category, um, of actor and of performer. But again, uh, fortunately we got a chance over the years and, and still, you know, when people can see his work archived, to see him in the different roles and really expressing the essence of who he is. This is, uh, we dug this up too. Look at this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> SOB. Yeah. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, look at all the iconic figures in that too. Right. And, and you know, he was, he, he was kind of a crazy doctor in that, uh, you know, it was a comedic role, um, satiric yes. and he was fabulous in it. Um, yeah. and I think he probably would have been nominated for uh, an Academy Award for that, you know, Dr. Feingarten. But um, I think because the movie itself was um, kind of uh, a drag on the Hollywood movie industry, I don't think they wanted to give any awards. Uh, you know, they didn't want to nominate anybody for that film just because it was kind of a poison pill to the um, studio system and the movie industry. So, but he was fa fabulous in that movie. Just, you know, he stole the show. Uh, some people, you know, could, you chatted with Leslie Ann Warren and they had asked, was there any connection between you and Leslie Ann? Is there a familial connection? <laughs> no, it's just, it's obviously just a common name. I don't know. There could be way back or something, but I, yeah. I don't think so. No. What was it like speaking to her for this, uh, this book? She, and you know, you, I don't know if you've spoken to her at all, but she is the most wonderful person, um, so down to earth. Again, she was somebody I reached out to her agent and asked if she would be willing to speak to me um, about uh, her work with Robert Preston on The Music Man. And she immediately said yes and called, you know, and we uh, had an in-depth conversation. And um, lovely, lovely person, very honest. And I can't say enough wonderful things about her. She's she's not only a great actress, but a, a wonderful person. Loretta Swit, too, who we had uh, as a guest on the show, and you know, beloved iconic figure in so many different uh, roles. Of course, uh, Hot Lips uh, on Mash for mm -hmm. so many years. But she was in her New York City apartment when she was a guest on the show, and she showed us her beautiful paintings. Yeah. And she had her dog with her. She was just a real delight. What was it like for you when you had an opportunity to chat with Loretta? Uh, equally delightful. Um, yeah. I, I was on the phone with her longer than I expected. Um, we talked at length about uh, Robert Preston and her role in uh, SOB. And there, the interactions not only with Robert Preston off the set, but Blake Edwards and Julie Andrews and the rest of the crew. 
Um, but then, I mean, she's just such a, she, again, she's just such a gracious, wonderful lady. Um, we spent, uh, I think we spent just as much time talking about Robert Preston as we did about other elements of her career and her personal life and her, um, you know, hobbies and the things that she, she was doing, not only on behalf of animals, but uh, all of her artwork, et cetera. So just, uh, it was just a wonderful experience to be able to uh, speak with her and um, get her insight as to what uh, Robert Preston was all about and her interactions with him as well. In this extraordinary book, you also had an opportunity to chat with uh, members of the Preston family. Um, what was that experience like as well? Because then that's a, it's a whole other uh, angle and, and perspective into this man's life. Um, the family, uh, family members that I spoke to and communicated with um, all felt the same way as fans did or people who um, are appreciative of his body of work. Um, things that they told me was that, you know, whenever he entered a room, even if he didn't say anything, he completely commanded a room. That's how, how much charisma he had. Um, and so they were all aware of that, uh, nieces and nephews, et cetera, from a very young age. Um, and they all spoke the same way as uh, his professional colleagues did, that he was uh, a very loving man. Um, very kind to his nieces and nephews. Um, they couldn't say enough nice things about him. So uh, same, you know, I, I got the same input from his family as I did um, from the professionals who worked with him. And I, you know, I got a few little anecdotes here and there about uh, from his uh, family. One of the uh, nephews commented about how physically strong he was that he could even on his um, farm, he lived in Connecticut for a while. Um, he would chop down trees on his own and drag things. And he was very, very powerful physically. And some of the stunts also that he performed um, on set in various movies, like The West was one, uh, he did on his own. He was, uh, you know, uh, very able and nimble and able to do those kinds of things. So uh, it was just very interesting to find out um, what he was like as an uncle and um, a friend and as well as as well as an actor. He was also a uh, captain, World War II, 386th yeah. Bombardment Group, United States Army, Air Force, uh, and served from 42, 1942 to 45. Yeah. And his years active, you know, as a performer, 1938 to 1987, born in Newton, Massachusetts in yeah. 1918, passed, of course, at the premature age of 68 in uh, California back in 1987. He appeared um, in a stock company production of Julius Caesar at the Pasadena Playhouse, which everybody, of course, loves. And a Paramount Pictures attorney liked his work and recruited him to the studio. And then the LA Times had reported that Robert's mother was employed by Decca Records, Bing Crosby's label at the time, and was, a, was a, uh, acquainted with Crosby's brother, Everett, mm -hmm. who was a talent agent. She convinced him to watch one of Preston's performances at the Pasadena Playhouse, and the result was a contract with Crosby's agency and then the movie deal with Paramount Pictures, right? Right, right, right. yes. Um, there's some conflicting uh, stories about how exactly he got discovered. Was it through this lawyer, um, through Paramount Pictures, or was it through Everett Crosby? And it could very well be that uh, they weren't mutually exclusive. It could be very well that um, the uh, Crosbys um, and the attorney from Paramount kind of were working in tandem, and um, Preston ended up with the uh, contract from Paramount. And... Um, uh, you know, of he, course, they asked him to change his name. To, yes. They pretty much ordered him to to change his. But it wasn't completely. I mean, some people's um, names were completely, you know, like uh, uh, Judy Garland was like Francis Gum. So, I mean, that was completely right. different. He was actually Robert Preston Missouri. So all they had him do was drop the last name and he kept his uh, first and middle name. And actually throughout his life, 
he never, I mean, people called him Robert, but he went by his middle name all the time. He went by Preston. So um, his first, I, I would say up through high school, um, he was only known, I mean, his family interacted with him using the name Preston and his friends did as well. So um, in his later years, if he um, kind of wanted to bring you into a circle or felt you were somebody that he wanted to get to know, he would encourage the person to call him Press or Preston um, because that's the name that um, he knew growing up. Of course, he was with Mary Martin in the Broadway play I Do, I Do in 1966, which was uh, really fantastic. There he won his second Tony Award as well, right? Yes. And that particular show um, is kind of hard to pull off because it's a two person, <laughs> two person Broadway play. And uh, there's no chorus. There's no other actors uh, available so that if you need to run off stage to do a costume change or anything else, um, somebody else has to be on stage singing or, you know, a soliloquy or doing something. And your time off stage is quite limited because you got to get back on um, to do the next scene. And so uh, Preston and Martin were in their 40s at the time. And it was quite, I mean, it's relatively young, but, you know, for um, only having the two of them on stage, it was it was grueling and um, they were able to do it not only um, on Broadway, but they went on national tour uh, and it was uh, so grueling. In fact, that uh, Mary Martin had developed some physical uh, medical problems and they had to end up cutting the uh, tour national tour short. But um, I got to, you know, give kudos to both of them, uh, two middle-aged actors and they were able to pull off, uh, the Broadway show uh, in a stunning way. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, Robert Preston was acknowledged uh, as best actor uh, for his role as Michael in I Do, I Do. Which yeah. was terrific. And of course, people uh, may or may not know Murray Martin being uh, Larry Hagman's mother. Yes, mom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, uh, so that's another iconic. And of course, the first Tony, uh, the music man. And um yeah, I mean, when you look back at the body of work, it, it is just extraordinary. For you, Deborah, is The Music Man your personal favorite, or are there other pieces of work that Robert was involved in that maybe speaks to you more than The Music Man? Uh, I, I definitely uh, am a Music Man fan, but uh, one of the films that is very difficult to access is um, Dark at the Top of the Stairs. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I've i seen it, but I don't think it's um, out on DVD or I, I think maybe you can get pirated copies, but I'm not sure. But he was phenomenal uh, as Reuben Flood in that uh, movie. Uh, it was an acclaimed movie at the time. And I think that is another role that um, he was just, he just nailed. And um, so that's one of my favorites um, as well. And um, of course, Victor Victoria. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, his uh, that kind of showcases uh, Preston's ability uh, to be comedic uh, off the cuff. And um, I think uh, also uh he when he looked at the script uh you know which which i learned in my research um when he looked at the script he insisted uh to blake edwards that he would he was happy to do the role but he did not want to portray toddy in any stereotypic way it was very important for him because he he knew so many um people lgbtq people um in the in Broadway, in the film industry, both actors and actresses and crew and behind the scenes people, that he wanted to make sure that he portrayed Toddy not in some type of cookie cutter caricature way that was maybe pejorative, derogative. He wanted to portray him as a real human being who just a real man who just happened to be prefer men and happened to be gay. So that was his philosophy um, of life. That was the way he looked at it. He was kind of ahead of his time. 
Um, and it was very important to him to portray that character that way. And um, he was recognized for it at the time uh, by various groups. And uh, he was very progressive uh, politically. He was very liberal. We called it liberal in those days. Um, even start in the 50s, he always supported uh, Democratic candidates. He was against the Vietnam War. Um, so he was uh, always a very liberal, progressive person. And that kind of manifested itself again uh, when he took on the role of Toddy and Victor Victoria. You know, something else that, uh, and we're talking with uh, Deborah Warren, she is the author of this really incredible book. It's a definitive look at the life of the iconic Robert Preston, Forever the Music Man. We have the author with us here, coming to us from uh, just north of Chicago in the suburbs there. And this has been a labor of love for her uh, in so many different ways. And, and, I, and again, look, it, it, you know, Take some time, sink in. Uh, you're going to just absolutely love it. We wholeheartedly recommend it. Uh, one of the things, too, that people might not realize, back in 61, uh, Robert was asked to make a recording as part of a program by the President's Council on Physical Fitness to encourage school children to do more daily exercise and copies of the recording of the song Chicken Fat, written and composed by Meredith Wilson, was performed by Robert with full orchestral accompaniment and actually distributed to elementary schools mm -hmm. across the nation and played for students as part of their calisthenics. And then it became a surprise novelty hit and part of many baby boomers' childhood memories, right? Yes, and even uh, if people uh, have watched The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, Chicken Fat was played in one episode, um, uh, you know, because it was kind of something that was common in the early 60s. And so uh, it was a staple. I think people uh, that are of the baby boomer generation uh, all know Chicken Fat. They maybe weren't aware that Robert Preston was the vocalist of, of it. Uh, but how many people I've run into, I mean, that was either played over the loudspeaker first thing in the morning or played in their gym class. Um, and so they're, you know, it, it, it's a fond memory for them, uh, of that. And it, and in fact, it's something, it's so, it's got such a zippy tune to it. I mean, it's even something I use, um, when I go to the health club, it's like, I'll put in the, uh, earbuds and play chicken fat and, you know, because it's, it's kind of, it's, <laughs> it it's, 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 it's got a good tempo to it. So, um, yeah, I think that's another, you know, thing that people maybe forget is that, um, he, uh, offered his, his voice and his services free of charge to, um, get that record produced. And, uh, so it could be distributed to schools across the nation. Which is so wonderful. Uh, of course, Mame with Lucille Ball was another iconic uh, opportunity, huh? It was for him. He 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 was fabulous in his role as Beauregard. Although uh, the critics, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, panned the movie uh, yes, pretty pretty much because of uh, Lucille Ball, and I think there was a large contingent because um, Angela Lansbury had played the role on Broadway. I think a lot of the uh, fans and critics had uh, hoped that Angela would reprise the role on um, the screen, and that didn't happen. Uh, Lucille Ball instead uh, purchased the rights to uh, do the movie. And, uh, you know, I mean, it didn't take away from his. I think one of the bright stars in the, in the movie is Robert Preston and his uh, portrayal of Beauregard. But unfortunately, um, you know, uh, a lot of people don't like the movie in general just because of all the uh, because of Lucille Ball being in it and all the controversy uh, regarding her starring as Mame versus Angela Lansbury. I'd heard that over the years as well myself. And there he is with Gary Cooper and Ray Milan, another iconic. He loved he loved Gary Cooper. Um, yes. <laughs> he, um, uh, you know, uh, was a friend of Gary Cooper in the day and um, uh, just was amazed by his talent as well. And how uh, I think there was one episode, I believe it was in Bo Jest and um, where uh, 
Gary was asked to, you know, be dead in a scene or play dead or whatever. And, and uh, uh, Preston couldn't even believe that he wasn't dead because that's right. how convincing he was. Uh, but yeah, Gary Cooper was a, a, another actor uh, that, you know, was just phenomenal. And um, Preston recognized that. And uh, I think, um, you know, took little bits and pieces, what he called Cooperisms, um, and kind of incorporated that into his own acting style as well. 74, he starred alongside Bernadette Peters, Jerry Herman's Broadway musical, Mac and Mabel uh, as well. And I mean, the list of incredible things that go on. In 79, he portrayed a snake handling family patriarch, Hadley Chisholm, in the CBS Western miniseries, The Chisholms. With uh, Rosemary Harris, yeah. Yeah, as Minerva, mm -hmm. and uh, which was another fantastic one as well. And of course, we know Victoria, Victor Victoria in 82. But then also, um, Semi-Tough in 1977. That's an interesting one. Big Ed Bookman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a fascinating scene. Um, in, it's a hysterical scene in that movie where he's crawling around on the floor uh, with Burt Reynolds. You know, they're doing this new age right. uh, therapy kind of thing. And uh, there's clips of that on YouTube that, uh, you know, people can see. And uh, so again, there, I mean, it was kind of tongue in cheek. He was able to um, play the role of Big Ed Bookman, not only the tough side of Big Ed, but, you know, uh, getting involved in this uh, new age uh, therapy, so to speak. And um, he and Burt Reynolds had a, a close relationship, um, were close off screen. In fact, they socialized um, when uh, Preston was in uh, the you know, Los Angeles area. Um, it was a kind of a mutual admiration. So, um, it, he loved working on that film. He, uh, I mean, he was working really right up to the end, just about in 83, he played an aging gunfighter in September gun, a CBS television, Western film opposite Patty Duke and Christopher Lloyd. Yes. And then he also starred in the well-received HBO 1985 movie Finnegan yeah. begin again with Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he was, um, you know, like I said, he was he was versatile um, and, uh, he, you know, his philosophy from way back uh, when he was a young man was it was his belief that there was no reason for an actor to not have work. And I know it kind of sounds a little bit crazy, but he felt that doing something was better than nothing. So even if it was summer stock, or doing something in your local theater or whatever. If you had an opportunity to act, you should take it not only, you know, for income, but to hone your skills. And that's what he did his entire life. He, you know, from the time he was uh, pre-adolescent to the time he passed away, um, he was continually working pretty much. And, um, you know, he enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, he, I don't want to say he couldn't understand actors who struggled to get parts because as we know uh there are only, there were so many parts and a lot more actors but uh he did continually work whether it was like i said in regional theater in summer stock um on broadway in film on tv uh he uh loved to hone his craft he loved to work and he did i mean there's so many when you look back sly fox the lion in winter and too uh, true to be good and Many others is his last, his final role in the television film Outrage in 1986, where he portrayed a grief stricken father who was seeking justice for the brutal rape and murder of his daughter. Um, that was that was quite quite a film. It was, and I think from if people look at the film, he doesn't look particularly well in the film, uh, which kind of helped his. <laughs> portrayal of a grieving father because he, you know, he just looked um, like he was downtrodden and grieving. Uh, I believe uh, he probably had undiagnosed cancer at that time uh, and probably wasn't aware of it. And that probably was, uh, you know, giving him kind of that worn out appearance too in the uh, TV movie. But uh, you're absolutely right. That was his last uh, on screen, uh, on the small screen uh portrayal um and uh he he enjoyed it he, he co-starred along with uh bo bridges who he had also 
Uh, there was a, a movie uh, earlier, a couple decades earlier, Child's Play, that yes. he had starred with uh, Bo Bridges. And in fact, the Bridges family years back uh, was very close to uh, Catherine and Robert Preston. In fact, I had heard stories unsubstantiated that uh, Bo Bridges actually learned to swim in Robert Preston's pool in Brentwood. Really? <laughs> so I, I've, there's pictures of it actually at the uh, Lilly Library where you can see uh, Bo jumping into the pool at uh, Robert Preston's home. So uh, the families were particularly close when Preston and Catherine were living in California in the early years. They, of course, moved to um, New York so that he could pursue Broadway. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, how close they kept in touch after that. But uh, Preston did have an opportunity to work with Bo on two occasions. It, it, again, the, the commentary and the response to this extraordinary book has been and continues to be really, really fantastic. Uh, readers outside of acting who choose Robert Preston Forever the Music Man for its scholarly probe into Preston's life and achievements will find the close attention to the variety of productions to be enlightening and absorbing. Library strong in film and stage biographies must have this delightful in-depth profile of Robert Preston's world and how he approached and furthered his career. That is from Dee Donovan, senior reviewer from Midwest Book Review. How beautiful that is, huh? To have a comment yeah. uh, coming in like that. Yeah. And there's been a lot of great reviews. Um, this, how did you know, and it's one of the hardest things, you know, I ask folks oftentimes when they're writing something, was it hard to get started and put those first few words on paper and know where to begin? Was it hard to know when to cap this extraordinary book about incredible Robert Preston to know when to finish it, be done with it, maybe a couple of rewrites and know when to put the last period on the end of the last sentence and be able to feel comfortable enough to say, it's good, it's done, I'm done. Somebody else, we've had a couple of people, which I thought was really fascinating. They said when they wrote their books, the middle for them was the hardest part because they had an idea of how they wanted to begin. They sort of knew what the ending was going to be, but the bridge, the middle was hard for them. How about the writing process for you with this extraordinary book? Uh, the starting it was not difficult because as I mentioned before, I, I just began gathering information and, you know, put it in, folders in chronological order so that I could go back and weave, weave it together into his story. So the starting of it um, was not particularly difficult. What was difficult was um, I did receive an awful lot of information that I did, ended up not putting in the book um, after a lot of um, soul searching and contemplation and discussion with the attorney <laughs> um, only because some of the things could not be substantiated. Um, some of the things, you know, either family made a comment or, you know, people that I spoke to made comments about things, nothing, nothing particularly bad, but, um, and I couldn't uh, substantiate that. So I wasn't about to put something in writing that, you know, everything I put in the book was substantiated, um, either uh, by talking to a relative who told me about firsthand information or coworkers who um, saw him on set or had a, a off-screen friendship with him, uh, and also newspaper articles or interviews that he gave himself. But again, if somebody made a comment to me, perhaps about another uh, relationship, extramarital relationship that he had or whatever. And it was something that I couldn't substantiate. It got left out because, um, you know, I wasn't about to either, you know, go off in a path that uh, it was, it, I, I just wanted the book to be the facts and the facts that I could substantiate. In fact, there was one um, woman who made a remark. It was a fan. She had made a remark about um, the Prince of Grand Street. And I had seen that comment online and talk, you know, 
connected with it. And when I talked to Neva Small, there just to give you an example, uh, she said that's absolutely not true. I was there, I was his co-star. Uh, some lady had mentioned that he flubbed a line or, you know, it was he had to, about his performance. And uh, Neva had said to me, that's absolutely not true. That didn't happen. And I don't know why this person would say that, but, um, you know, whatever she's saying is not true. So there were situations like that, that I had to try to fact check. And if I couldn't fact check them, of course, in that case, I did fact check it and it wasn't true. Um but there were things like that that, uh, you know, there were some, they were kind of small and inconsequential for the most part. But that's where I struggled with, you know, what what do I put in here in this in this biography? What do I not put in here? And my line in the sand was only things I could verify and substantiate. And I didn't want the book to be about gossip or innuendo or anything. It was just just the facts. And so that's, you know, they, I, I, like I said, I did struggle with that. But in the end, um, it made it made my job easier when I just made the decision um, not to go in that direction. So um, I, I could have put a lot more in the book. Like I said, there were so many other people that I had wanted to interview for the book and either didn't respond or, um, you know, through their agent or direct uh, contact. Uh, either didn't have an interest in providing input or um, whatever, uh, which is unfortunate because I think they could have maybe given me a little bit more uh, insight into what he was about in particular um, vehicles. And of course, there were a lot of people, you're showing a photo there of Debbie Reynolds. It would have been wonderful to interview her as well, but she sadly had passed away. So there were so many people who had um, that he had worked with in the past uh, that had passed away that I was unable to interview. And also there were um, a few people that um, I reached out to, but, you know, didn't receive a response. Um, one of the most interesting interviews I did have, though, was with Christopher Walken. I mean, he was, it was a hoot. And there were things about him and his career um, that, uh, in talking about Preston's career, uh, that were uh, very interesting and eye-opening to me as well. But uh, so the people I did, I was able to speak to, whether it's family, friends, or coworkers, um, did give me a lot of uh, very important detail about what his character was like, and what his work ethic was like, and his um, professional credo was like. And so um, I don't think I uh, missed very much, even by not talking to the few people I could have because I think uh, I got a wealth of information from the people I did speak to. Which is incredible to be able to get that because, you know, sometimes, like you say, it isn't always easy to right. for people to open up or to share or to express and, and even to remember some of the situations that have occurred, if it's been something where a lot of time has uh, passed. It is an extraordinary read, as I mentioned. I was so excited to have you come on. What um, what are a couple of things that you hope readers get from this book, whether they are long-term, long-time fans of Robert Preston, or they just love Hollywood, they love Broadway, they love film, they love television. What are some things you hope the reader is left with? As far as Robert Preston is concerned, I hope that he is kind of seen through new eyes as a, a wonderful actor and a consummate professional. I, I think he's kind of a role model for how actors and actresses should be, whether it's in Hollywood or on Broadway. I, You know, you hear so many stories, whether they're true or untrue, of, you know, drama on the set or you know, feuds or difficulty or whatever. And uh, it makes it difficult not only for the directors and the co-workers, um, but, you know, just just the reputations of the actors at large. And I think that, you know, he made a point of not wanting to be drama free at work and being completely professional. And I think a lot of the actors and actresses 
uh, today could learn a lesson from him. And I think that's why one of the reviewers made that remark about how it's it would it's helpful for um, uh, people who are involved in the acting profession because uh, I think he had it right. I mean, it was a job just like, you know, uh, all of us have jobs and we may be frustrated and we may come home and talk to our significant others about, uh, you know, things that were particularly vexing at work, but we keep, we don't keep it at work. We go to work again, the fresh the next day and um, do our jobs. And that's what he did. And I think that uh, there's lessons to learn there and how he handled his career. And I think, uh, you know, if he, his, um, Modus operandi is studied more by uh, the acting community, whether it be Broadway or Hollywood. I think uh, it would be beneficial to them. You know, I like the idea. One of the quotes I had mentioned where they talked about uh, it being in libraries and things of that nature. How terrific that would be. Huh? Is that something that you're trying to have done? Yes, yeah, so there are um, several, uh, many libraries that uh, have copies of the book. Uh, not only the public libraries, but also collegiate libraries as well. Perfect. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, people will read it, not not for my sake particularly, but to learn about this phenomenal man. And not only as a human being, but as a great actor. Did it give you a deeper appreciation of the man in both levels, both categories? Of it did. Life? It did. Because, uh, again, you know, there, there wasn't much out there um, kind of on the public stage or whether you know trying to google him or uh get information and um so i was really able to uncover um the true human true human being behind the actor and um uh I, I, you know he was he was just wonderful um i can see why his life his wife uh, just adored him and um so did his colleagues you know i i didn't find one person that I interviewed um, that had anything negative to say about him, uh, nor any uh, press clippings or other interviews, other audio interviews that um, I heard that I, you know, listened to, whether it be Barbara Cook or um, Shirley Jones or you know anyone else. Uh, no one had a bad thing to say about him, which which speaks volumes, uh, not only as a person but as a professional. And I, I don't think too many people in Broadway or Hollywood today, um, people, people could say that about to say that, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing bad um, negative that can be said about uh, a particular actor or actress. So uh, he's to be commended for that. Really a phenomenal book. It's the definitive folks. And this has been a labor of love for our very special guest author, Deborah Warren. Uh, you've penned other works. Do you see more in the offing? Uh, or is there another book that you're already working on? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, there's just been a flurry of different things, you know, regarding this book. But I certainly uh, would like to uh, devote more time now to perhaps um, doing something. I don't want to say semi-fictional. I've, you know, I've heard different um, stories of, uh, you know, and even through my past background in um, uh, political counseling. I mean, there's just been so many stories of people um, that, you know, uh, I've heard about and also just stories I've heard from family and friends through the years about, you know, different people or different scenarios. So um, I'm kind of exploring um, some of that and I'll see where that takes me in the future. But uh, as far as uh, a biography goes. I mean, my wish list would be um, Christopher Walken. He his um, interview was just fascinating, and I know he's uh, an awfully private person, and that's not anything I can see happening in his lifetime. But boy, I would certainly love the opportunity to be able to um, write his narrative as well. That would be so fantastic, wouldn't it? To yeah. Have that happen. Well, good luck with that, and. Definitely keep us posted if you do. Uh, we're going to keep that porch light on for you, Deborah. You are now Great. part of the uh, Jim Master Show Lovety family. Our viewers commenting throughout the show. Lovety uh, during the course of our show, huh? <laughs> yeah. 
That's fantastic. Well, congratulations on the book. And also, I did want to make mention that uh, there is a terrific website as well that you created uh, that people can also peruse. Tell us about the website. Uh, yes, the uh, website is forevertheMusicMan.com. And uh, interested uh, people can certainly go on to the website to find out uh, information about the book, where to buy the book, um, and uh, some background information uh, uh, about Mr. Preston and yeah. uh, his career. So I encourage people who are interested to go to forevertheMusicMan.com and um, take a look, uh, or if they're interested in the book, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other yeah. places. So, Yeah. Congratulations on the book, really. Thank you. Extraordinary piece of work, but also an extraordinary piece of art. And uh, we thank you for, you know, putting so much of your time uh, and talent into writing it for all of us to really appreciate and, and enjoy. And again, you know, holidays coming up, folks, before you know, get your copy. I've got mine. She autographed it for me as well. And I sincerely, sincerely appreciate you doing that, Deborah. This was a delight and an honor and a pleasure to have you on the Gym Master Show live series. I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll spread the word about our show. And I hope you enjoyed the time with me and all of our great viewers watching live and folks be able to watch this in the archives on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. But I hope you enjoyed the time. Oh, it's been a pleasure. You, you're you're. A phenomenal host. Um, I, this has just been a wonderful experience. And I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come on and talk about Mr. Preston. The pleasure is all mine. And again, we'll keep that porch light on for you. You are welcome back uh, anytime. Just want to show you some of our, these are some of our regulars who love to comment in the Lovety Hole chat room. Kathleen Walker watching in New York City says, your book sounds great, Deborah. So glad to be here with this great conversation. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, we have a very proactive viewing audience, the Loveties. So they end up going out and they get the DVDs, the books, and uh, you'll probably see an uptick in uh, the books Wonderful. going out. Uh, Sherry's in uh, Kansas. She says, thank you for being here tonight, Deborah. What a wonderful conversation. And Pam, who's in Maryland, thank you, Jim and Ms. Warren. You are very, very welcome mm -hmm. from both of us, Pam, watching. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Deborah, thank you uh, again for stopping by the show, and uh, we'll keep that light on for you. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. You've been great. Absolutely. Next time, we might get you to play the piano. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Chopsticks. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You take care. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Deborah. Bye-bye now. She not extraordinary, everybody. That is author Deborah Warren, and uh, she's somebody who even before – all of her writing she gives back in her professional work in such a beautiful, beautiful way. And uh, what a fascinating look again at this life and this, uh, this iconic figure in Broadway and Hollywood television and film. Here is the book again, my copy read it cover to cover and had an opportunity to do so while I was busy flying crisscrossing the country uh, which we're going to be doing again soon. So I'm going to have to figure what's going to be the next book that I'll have to bring with me on, uh, you know, I finished the book on emotional intelligence, which I love as well. I'm very in tune with emotional intelligence. So I finished that one. This came direct in the mail. Deborah was generous to send this and uh, autograph it as well in time for this episode so I can get a good feel for the book. And again, it's uh, the critics love it. The fans of Hollywood and Broadway love it. And uh, the fans of Robert Preston love it as well. Those who, you know, worked with him, the family as well, uh, loving it. And uh, she put a lot of time and attention, a lot of research, a lot of archival information, a lot of fresh new information, not only about the iconic star, but also a little behind the scenes about the man the man behind all the glamour, behind all of the uh, incredible fanfare that you saw on Broadway, perhaps, and in all the movies. And you can see in classic movie, uh, you know, the different channels that air the classic movies and things of that nature. Really a definitive look at the life of a uh, an American iconic figure 
in entertainment, Robert Preston, um, who unfortunately we did lose uh, at an early age, at the age of 68, back in 1987. Uh, but again, the body of work that he left with and for all of us stands tried and true today. Uh, one of the wonderful things that I loved, if you were listening deeply as I was, which I love to do when I have conversations with people, especially when we're doing conversations like this, is uh, a resounding theme that Deborah was expressing as far as the man being so dedicated to his work and everybody having great things to say about him because he was, you know, he was all in and he enjoyed the work. And it's so wonderful that he felt the appreciation, you know, as time went on in his life, maybe not till later in his life, like Deborah shared with us, but still he got a chance to, to really feel um, the appreciation for all of the work that uh, he expressed with all of us. And Robert Preston, again, uh, an iconic figure, celebrated and remembered here on the Jim Masters Show. We want to show you a full look at that book. There it is. You can go to uh, forevertheMusicMan.com. Also available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. You're going to love it, folks. You're going to get a chance to learn a little bit more about um, this iconic figure in American entertainment, uh, stage, film, television. He did it all. And uh, thank you very much for the great comments. Glad you enjoyed the show. We appreciate all this lovity coming in from everybody. And uh, those are folks who like to comment in our Lovity Hall chat room. But gang, we encourage and welcome you to be proactive and join us. Be interactive. Leave us a comment on our YouTube channel underneath the episode. That really, really helps us grow and expand even a bigger reach of millions around the world and give a thumbs up like there's a thumbs up icon on our youtube channel give us a thumbs up like we would love your like we appreciate that that helps us grow as well and don't forget to subscribe to the youtube channel where you can see this episode again if you came in late missed anything joined us late or you just want to see it again or you want to share this with friends subscribe to the youtube channel gym masters tv and be sure and click the notification bell icon so you never miss be alerted about all the episodes we have coming up. Thanks for all the activity, the comments, everything that uh, you guys have been sharing. Those of you who watch and comment during the show, and those of you who are watching this later on when the show isn't live, we appreciate you as well. I know we talk a lot about the folks that watch when the show is live, but I just want to take a quick moment to thank those of you who watch, and there are thousands around the world who are still discovering our series and you watch and you comment and you send messages and you tweet about it and you do Instagram and Facebook and all commentary and, and you share the links and you send us messages as well. And we person, I personally thank you for all that love and support uh, of our series and what we're doing here, bringing back the lost art of conversation in a fun and engaging way with all of you uh, involved and invested in what we're doing. It's, it's a hoot to have an opportunity to do it. And I'm so glad that, uh, you know, it, with my crazy schedule working in the industry, I created this three and a half years ago and you are still with us. So thanks to the loyal fans and thanks to all the new folks. If it's your first time sampling the Gym Masters Show series, we love having you here. One more time. A big thanks to our very special guest, author, a very special guest, author extraordinaire, Deborah Warren, joining us as we celebrate Hollywood legend, Broadway star, Robert Preston. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. We really appreciate you being with us. Spread the word about our show. Uh, we love when you do that. And we'll see you on the next one. A great week, great month. Great year ahead of all kinds of episodes. Take a look at the YouTube channel and see who's coming up as well. For all of us here, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, come see us again. I'll be right here waiting for you in Lovety Hall on the Jim Masters Show. Take care and be well. And cheers. <laughs>